So what is a story like this doing a movie like that? Aeon Flux, based off the animated series of the same name. Directed by Karen Kusama, released in December of 2005, with a runtime of 1 hour and 35 minutes. Starring Charlize Theron, Martin Zokas, Johnny Lee Miller, and Sophie Okon... Okan Edo. Okan Edo? No. Sophie Okan Edo had a production budget of $62 million, with a domestic take of $25 million, a foreign take of $26 million, worldwide total of $52 million, unfortunately giving us a loss of $9 million. I say unfortunately because I honestly think this movie deserved to do better than that. Okay, let's jump into the characters. We'll start with Aeon Flux, the main character and the vengeance-driven assassin in this story. It took me a while to get used to the character. It took me a while to figure out what was actually going on here. And to be honest, at first, I just thought this was the most dried-out, placeholder, stand-in sort of character I've ever seen in a main lead. Her character kept jumping between plastic automaton to a more layered, complex human. But then I discovered, as we go through it further through the story, you, you kind of, you start to see that melt, you see that chain. When they, they portray her as the fast, dangerous assassin, she's stealthy, she's highly skilled, she's got lots of tricks up her sleeve, she's efficient, she's ruthless. They never really take you to the heights of what you're kind of expecting when they, when they describe her as the perfect assassin. Quick editor's note, you do get to see her go full savage though. She takes down a pair of heavily armed, heavily armoured uh, soldiers with a blade of glass. So... That was pretty nifty. I ended up enjoying her story more than enjoying her, though. Yeah, the concept of her, I found more engrossing. Hmm. Next up, we have Trevor Goodchild, the plot twist villain. Quite well performed by Martin Sokus. Once you warm up to him, once they start, once they drop the android veneer, I suppose he really doesn't do anything other than push the story along and provide some decent exposition. Not super dynamic or anything, but you'd miss him if he wasn't in the story. In fact, he's integral to the story in one way. Yeah, much like Aeon's story path, it's windy and complicated and uh, weird. Owen Goodchild, the brother of Trevor, is our actual antagonist. He's our actual villain of the piece. His motives at the start appear to be the standard, for the greater good we will commit bad things. Uh, but as it, but as the story goes along, they narrow right down to a very selfish, personal motive. Quite slimy too. Came across as a as your slimy politician quite well. I was also wondering where I'd seen him before, and it turns out that he is Sherlock in the US TV series. And now we have Sathandra, Aeon's gal pal assassin buddy. Kind of reserved, a little dull and bland at the start, like all of the other characters in this movie. And then they all develop into something else. Not much of something else for some of them. But yes, Seth Andrew was a very interesting um, companion in the movie. She came across as the tough girl. She wasn't portrayed as skilled as Aeon, but she got a feeling that she, she could definitely hold up in a fight. They did a real weird thing with her, though. They gave her hands for feet. It's kind of cool to watch and also kind of off-putting at the same time. And I did like the way they had it change her movement. She walked differently. She stood differently because she had hands for feet. I'm not sure how they achieved that in practical effects. Maybe they just had specific sorts of uh, shoes on for her or something. But her gait changed. The way she moved was different. Her character design has drawn a fair bit of criticism online at one stage. Due to the fact that she was one of the few dark-skinned characters in the movie with hands for feet, which made her very, very good at climbing trees. Yeah. A rather unfortunate design option in that respect. You then had a couple of support characters. Um, you had Aeon's sister, Una. Important as a plot device, fairly forgettable as a screen presence. And it also felt like a lot of her lines were dubbed at one stage. Freya, uh, Trevor's right-hand girl. Good in a fight, good with a gun. Unfortunate casualty of the uh, political war that erupts. And we've got uh, Garau, a council member that keeps popping up every now and then. Has a couple of decent lines, delivered well, delivered with feeling. I thought I'd seen him before, made me curious, so I jumped on IMDb. Not in a lot of movies, but in a lot of TV shows. I mean, a lot of TV shows. 
one of those background actors or support actors that you look up on IMDb and they've got a body of work like hundreds of pages long. <laughs> Una's husband, Claudius, another plot device, fairly decently portrayed. Again, not much to begin with, but then you've got more to work with later in the movie. It's a character called the Handler. Very weird, ethereal, dream design character. Didn't really do much, but was there enough that it worthy of a mention? So overall for the characters, uh, whilst they had some very striking design and they had some interesting story developments as characters themselves are not terribly engaging. So I'll be giving the characters a 2.5. Righto, story. Okay, this is the bit that really caught me off guard. This is the bit I was not expecting. Not at all. It starts off so, well, generic, so painfully generic. And then slowly, as you're going through the movie, you suddenly realize that this story has been getting deeper and more complex and deeper and starting to tackle uh, concepts and questions that I was not expecting to ever think about while watching just another sci-fi action flick. Toward, towards the end of the movie, I was almost getting annoyed at it. What is a story like that doing in a movie like this? Why do we have this absolute gem of a storyline lying in a puddle? I don't know. It's one of those stories that I want to see remade. I'd really like to see this movie remade with a modern budget and all the tricks that we've got now, but keep this story. Don't fiddle with that. Keep the elements of the story and what they are trying to say. Starts off real simple. We've had a massive apocalypse event. A virus has wiped out 99% of the world. Five million people are left behind in one city. The city's governed by a totalitarian, totala, 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 totalitarian, totalitarian government under which the people are happy and healthy. There's the underlying menace, people go missing, and the secret police are everywhere. So far, fairly stock and standard. But then over the next hour, it wanders off into deep questions like who wants to live forever? Nature versus control. And what is it to be human at all? It's told in such a way that as the story is revealed, the mystery only builds. Now, you start to have an idea of what it could be. There's a couple of options of what it could be. And since many of us have watched many, many sci-fi movies, yeah, you've got, you've got your normal list of options. So, and you start wondering which of those options it'll be. And you don't really get any definite direction of that until a good, oh, until around about late second act. You got your political intrigue with some double cross. I mean, the brother's betrayal was quite um, expected. It was telegraphed early on in the movie. I ended up making so many notes about the story. I'm, I'm having trouble actually putting my thoughts into words. It went all over the place. But the director kept doing odd little things throughout the movie. You've got the whole uh, setup of Aeon's character, the death of his sister, all that sort of thing at the start. But then it flashes forward and you suddenly realize that that was the origin setup for Aeon's current situation. But they don't explain that. They don't tell it in the normal way of telling that sort of setup. Another example is the little romance that they throw in the movie. Very expected. However, the reason for it and the way they did it and everything else about it, not so expected and, and a little unconventional. Uh, infant side as a way of controlling the population through the murder of mothers. That's dark. That's a dark concept. And they just chug, they just drop it in the movie and move along. All right, sure. Then they're racing off to save the cure from the bad guy, like they always do in these movies. And they don't get it back. It's burnt to the ground. The cure is wiped out. We're done. That's it. Normally in the third act, you run off to save the thing to get the thing and you save the day. Yay. Not in this one. No. Nah. Seriously, this movie did not follow the rules of formula. It kept surprising me. Very rude. And in keeping with the somewhat unpredictable themes, at the very end you find out that Aeon's entire existence is a long-term payoff from a forward-thinking scientist who, who decided maybe we should keep this one around because we're probably going to need her later. As for the action, there was a whole bunch of action scenes in here. Most of them fairly unremarkable. Not all the time. Some of them were done quite well. Others... They're just, they're there, there we go. Mainly Aeon taking out a whole plethora, plethora, lots of enemy soldiers. She has a, she has a punch up with a buddy at one stage. You have to kill the bad guy. The bad guy's not as bad as we think. Now I have to kill you. I'll just knock you out because you're my buddy. That sort of thing. A nice little action scene where they have to escape a house. 
run around, jump into a subway. The bad guys prove that the bad guys by happily mowing down everyone between them and their target. And then after countless scenes of killing soldiers left, right and center, they break into another guardhouse and Trevor decides to talk them all down and they join, they agree to switch sides and join him. Yeah, I was just expecting another break and enter scene with killing everybody in the tower, grabbing stuff and moving on. Not, no, no, son, you don't want to do that. Join us. And them going, yeah, okay. Your big final fight scene, the big showdown, that was suitably dramatic. You got, you got enemy soldiers dropping like stormtroopers. You got highly effective support fire from the rebels. The rebels all die, of course, but they're quite stylistically taken out, which isn't bad. Much like the characters in the movie, the story starts very broad and quite bland and eventually narrows all the way down to something very interesting and quite philosophical, really, and uh, something deeper to consider. How dare the story not conform to my preconceived ideas? It didn't fit. So I find myself in an unusual situation in this one where the story outshines the characters by far. It intrigued me, it engrossed me, it surprised me, it had me thinking about stuff I wasn't expecting to think about. So all things considered, I think I'll be giving this a four. You're surprised. I'm the one that watched it. I'm surprised. Look and feel. This movie looked beautiful. The design and style of this movie was great. It kind of had a real, oh, Star Trek Fifth Element, a little bit of Star Wars feel to it. Great use of light and shadow and color and just space. They use the space very well. They use the bleak nature of some industrial design and some warm interior designs and just some excellent use of line. Really dynamic to watch. I was quite taken in with the visuals. Rich tones against the stark backgrounds or dynamic lighting dropping across someone's face. You'd have a scarf just falling to the ground or, 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 or a stage curtain blowing open. Really, really visually engaging. It absolutely caught my attention, held my attention. I think that's why the story crept up on me and surprised me. See, I'd already given up on the characters and I was not impressed by the script. So I was looking, I was trying to salvage what I could, which then of course allowed the story and the developing characters and the improving dialogue to completely ambush me. And cool cyber and sci-fi tech, they got these little communication beads buried under the skin that you gotta scratch your skin open to, and you can do psychic links to each other. And, you, and Aeon can change your eye to, for, for extreme close-up vision and stuff like that. It's cool concept for a sonic stun grenade as well. I like that. Also bioweapons. In this case, a biomachine gun fruit pod sitting in a tree. Bizarre. I liked it. I now have a better idea of how Tyranid weapons work in Warhammer 40k too. And the way that the agents will communicate to each other via this really weird Doctor Who cross Lord of the Rings ethereal conference room sequence the lighting in that was in was crazy really bright white lights and the handler's got this vivid shock of red hair so the whole thing looks bizarre she summons a flower out through her mouth and she blows out the pollen which then settles all over aeon into her eyes and that's how she receives a memory map of where she has to go i'd love to see this design style and probably this director do an actual proper shadow run movie that'd be cool oh yeah, and this really bizarre concept for a surveillance pool. Literally, you've got, looks like drip water dripping into this pool. And each drip has information about what they're seeing, what's out there. It's like security camera feeds, but in water format, dropping into this pool, which has got all these ripples and, and images of different scenes, different places, different things. And the audio effect in that room and the lighting and the general design was really nice. And lots and lots of dynamic camera shots and camera tricks. There's a nice little jail cell interrogation um, between Trevor and Aeon. And they've got their reflections of each other on the glass as they're talking to each other. I can see where the majority of the 62 million it cost to produce this movie went. And it wasn't the CGI. The CGI was not that good. Yes, I'm looking back on a 2005 movie, but still... It wasn't that crash hot. So yes, the look and feel of this movie, much like the story, totally outplayed the rest of the movie. So much to my surprise, I'll be giving this one a 3.75 for the look and feel. And now on to script and dialogue. Right. Okay. 
it starts out very poor. The lines are delivered with such a monotone, such a controlled, lifeless fashion. Such a wooden performance from everybody. I was wondering what on earth I'm watching. And that's the reason I switched off and just started looking at the shiny things because there was nothing else. I was admiring the sets because there was nothing else to like. It stays quite reserved and conservative in its delivery and, and their speech for most of the movie. Because of this very neutral and um, stoic, that's the word I've been looking for this whole time. Reserved and stoic performance that when the characters crack and some of them tear up and start to cry or show great emotion, it really is quite a, a shock and it really stands out. And I think, again, that looks like by design. An effective design, an effective trick. If your audience is invested and wanting to stick around to find out. Most people that check into a movie that's been marketed this way aren't looking for this level of nuance. They're not waiting for the great drama, this social commentary to play out before them. It looked like an action film. It's sold as a sci-fi assassin adventure. Go watch some of the old trailers for it. What you end up getting is the Diet Coke version of a psychological study. The Pepsi Zero examination of the human soul. And the very last bloody scene gives a perfect example of the fact that it was all staged intentional. You have a flashback to Trevor and Aeon's former life. They're actually portrayed as humans. They've got these lovely smiles that just light up their face. The whole world feels warm and, and, and active and real. They purposely dull down these charismatic actors to give you the feeling of a sterile, controlled, broken world. And that I love. The fact that they murdered your expectations in the first act, I am not a fan of. At the end of all this, I'm afraid that the script's going to get a 2.5. Because I saw where they were going, I can see what they were trying to do. But they didn't give you enough context at the start that made you think you actually had a dud on your hands. Fun factor. To begin with, I need to buy this on Blu-ray. Because I want to watch this again with some higher definition. To be honest, I had to go back and watch this movie twice. I had to try and reconcile the story I just discovered with everything else that I'd just seen happen. What bugged me the first time still bugged me the second time. But what I really liked the first time was even better the second time. So yeah, average action, average lines, brilliant story, beautiful look. Uh, thing's going to land on a three. I want to give it higher because of that story. And I want to put it a lot lower for everything else. Now, it will feel unfair if I give it less than a three and undeserved if I give it a higher. So it's going to stay on three. Fun factor, three. We take them all, add them together, and we get a 15.75. To be honest, not the score I was expecting to give this when I sat down to watch it. Would I recommend it to anyone else? Perhaps. I'd have to explain the fact that the story is deeper than it looks. I'd have to explain that the whole thing builds up and you just got to bear with it kind of annoys me that there's a story like this hidden in a movie like that but at the same time this is why you watch movies this is why you go exploring the discount bin at jb hi-fi because you never know what you're going to find it can also be a complete and utter disaster and should be approached with extreme caution so there you have it a fairly conflicting nonsensical unexpected review of aeon flux thanks for watching and i hope you had a good time please comment below and subscribe if you liked it and as always, I hope everyone has a really good week.